Good afternoon. If you haven't already silenced your cell phones, if you'd take a moment to do that, that'd be great. We are making a recording of this, so it will be available on our website. And um, it's a joy to have all of you here this afternoon. Uh, Dr. Mark Pike is a friend of the Wade Center, has been here several times doing research, um, but this is his first time to come and speak to us. Um, this afternoon he'll be speaking on his book, Mere Education, C.S. Lewis as Educator for Our Times. Dr. Pike is Professor of Education and Head of the School of Education at the University of Leeds. He's also Director of the Narnian Virtues Character Education Research Project, which is funded by the John Templeton Foundation. And he'll be speaking on that this evening at 7 o'clock, also in the Bakke Auditorium. So I hope you'll be able to return for that. but. Um, we will be recording that as well. As an educator, as well as a parent of three, almost three teenage children, you know, two of them are already teenagers, Dr. Pike is exper an experienced guide to C.S. Lewis's educational vision. He's particularly interested in helping parents, students, teachers, and school leaders take Lewis's insights on education and apply them to current issues of critical importance for all of us. So if you join me in welcoming Dr. Pike. Well, thank you very much for having me today. And uh, as some of you may not be here this evening, uh, I should like to extend an invitation to you if you're not uh, able to be here this evening. If you're a parent of uh, an 11, 12, 13 year old or a teacher, uh, or if you work with or know people who work with 11, 12, and 13 year olds uh, the invitation is for you to join the Narnian Virtues project which is a research project we received funding in the summer from the John Templeton Foundation and they very kindly uh, gave us 1.1 million pounds uh, to do a significant research project into how three of the Narnia stories can enable children, young people, 11, 12, 13 year olds in particular, to develop the virtues underpinning good character. And there's, there's no catch uh, because it's fully funded. Uh, it, uh, the, the deal is uh, simply that you give up a couple of hours of your life to do the pre-test and the post-test so that we can see how much the children have learned. And uh, I won't say much more about that because that's the subject of tonight, but essentially the children spend two hours uh, per week for 12 weeks during the autumn from September till December, uh, reading The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and focusing on six virtues, six Narnian virtues. And uh, when they're 11 years old, the first autumn, they read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And then a year later, at the start of the academic year, when they are 12 years old, they read Prince Caspian. And then a year later, when they're 13 years old, in the autumn again between September and December, they spend two hours a week reading The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. So the commitment is two hours a week for 12 weeks and some home tasks with parents. We're very, very keen to work with parents and with teachers in the area of developing virtue and fostering good character through response to and engagement with the Narnia stories of C.S. Lewis. And there's more information on that tonight, but uh, I won't say any more about that now. Uh, it all really began, the, the, the research project, the research project really began with uh, mere education, um, which I will show you after showing you where I live. 
But before I show you where I live, I will introduce you to, uh, well, I'll show you where I live to start with. So Leeds, uh, the University of Leeds is about 200 miles north of London. J.R.R. Tolkien was professor of uh, Old English Anglo-Saxon at the University of Leeds before going to Oxford, which is, I think, roughly where the N of the London is. And Leeds is a large state uh, research intensive university. It's a Russell Group University, so it's a top 20 university with 36,000 students on a single campus in the north of England. But I'll just introduce you to uh, the Pikelets and some of their friends. This is young Jeremy Pike, our youngest. He's 11. This is Lydia, who's 14. And uh, Luke, after playing football, you would say soccer somewhere, and some of their friends. And my wife, Babs, for some reason, declined to be on the front cover of the book. Um, but she actually did the editing and the, the final third of the book, the notes. So it was a, you know, it was a, joint, a joint effort. And the reason that these young people are on the, the, the front of the book is because it's about how C.S. Lewis's vision of education relates to education and schooling today. So many, many books, as you may be aware, that uh, from the cover you would think, oh, that's about C.S. Lewis applied to education and schooling today end up being about the Oxford tutorial system or Malvern College or the educational system that Lewis went through and how he hated being at boarding school. And, and the, they're often quite biographical. Whereas uh, this, the, the, the theory here, the, um, the contention here is that if we look across Lewis's ethics, theology and fiction, over 30 books, you can see how that applies to, how his thought applies to current issues from primary, uh, elementary schooling through to universities like this one. So the, the reason for young people on the cover is because it's about education today. And uh, I'll just highlight the, the structure of, of the book so that you can see. We start with character education, move on to Christian education, and then spiritual education, why you need a map when you walk on the beach. And uh, this is all about the hinge of the wardrobe, the cardinal virtues, cardo, Latin for hinge. I don't think it's a coincidence that it's a uh, that the door into Narnia swings open and the the children cultivate virtue and good character while they're there. That's part one. Uh, the furniture of the house, liberal education, sex education, self-control and sales re resistance, biblical education, the basis of liberty, cultural education the foundations, understanding the foundations. Democratic education, the title of an important essay by Lewis, how to avoid dumbing down. And then teacher education, leadership education, and the future. I should say that uh, after a first degree at the University of Leeds, where I read English, and then teacher training at Nottingham University, I was a high school English teacher for 10 years. Uh, high school being 11 to 18 year olds, uh, from what we would call key stage three through to A level and uh, university entrance. And then I did a PhD at Southampton University in English in education and worked for 12, 13 years at the University of Leeds teaching English teachers in the area of initial teacher education and working quite closely with schools. And a couple of the chapters are available as a free download from Lutterworth.com, the first chapter and the seventh chapter. 
and the publisher was supposed to have some postcards here for you to get you a 20% discount on uh, I can't remember who the American publisher is. It's Lutterworth, the Lutterworth Press, Cambridge in, in England. But uh, there is a, a kind of an equivalent to Lutterworth here, uh, and it is, it is available. But from Lutterworth.com, the introduction, which you're going to hear about in just a moment, on Mia and the chapter on character education and cultural education are free, so you don't have to buy the book, which is worth knowing, especially if you're a student. So, so the word Mia, the word Mia, pure, unalloyed, unadulterated, nothing less than complete. It's where we get the English word merit from. So Mia education is all about excellence in schooling. And we're going to look a little more at this Middle English word in just a moment. <coughs> but before we do so, we'll just think about the liberal arts and repairing the ruins, Lieber being free, but also being a book. Lewis said, if you don't read good books, you will read bad ones and the the thesis of mere education is that the liberal arts have a vital role to play in educating for virtue so Lewis said he'd never met a mere mortal he wanted to be a mere Christian and his book mere Christianity began as Christian behavior, which I think we have a, a picture of. So what is now mere Christianity, as you may know, began as his broadcast talks during the Second World War, and Christian behavior was one of them. So mere Christianity. Let me show you a map, and we will delve a little more into this word mere, which is where we get the word merit from. So, you'll see where I'm going with this in just a moment. But where I live, about 30 miles from the sea here, and where my friends in the Netherlands live, around here, uh, mere education was translated into Dutch last year and I spend a lot of time working with schools in England and in the Netherlands but the coastline is being eroded keeping the sea and the land in their respective places is critically important if I go to the coast as I say 30 miles from where I live here there's a sign and as you look out to see it plots where the villages are that are now underwater and the land is being lost because it's a very soft um, very soft land and it's being washed away to sea so this this word mere that we're talking about to start with uh, where does that where does that come from? What are the origins of that? Well, Proto-Indo-European, spoken 6,000 years ago, on the fertile crescent between the Tigris and the Euphrates, the word may was, was to fence, and they had a bit of a problem keeping water and land in their respective places. Uh, the irrigation... The, the reason it is the fertile, or it was the fertile crescent, of course, was because, was because it flooded. So back to England. Um, and the Netherlands. So this is from a National Geographic magazine article in 1933. And the writer 
says our Department of Public Works would gladly make a present of a fine strip of Dutch shoreland to any of our inhabitants willing to take the responsibility of keeping land and sea in their respective places and recounts the efforts both medieval and modern to manage the boundaries. Lewis was a lifelong lover of the sea, interestingly enough. Uh, this is what this looks like. This is the erosion that I was speaking of that's happening. Uh, this is the English side of the North Sea. The Dutch are a bit more organized and they have less land and they seem to take it more seriously, the, the washing away of the land, as you'll see in, in just a moment. So we've said that Mia is all about merit and it's all about excellence and then we said there was this proto-Indo-European word about fencing and borders and boundaries and about keeping the sea and the land, the water and the land in their respective places. And Mia education seeks to provide a bulwark to set boundaries and to protect schools and schooling from the incoming tide of ideological assumptions that threaten to erode and undermine the wholeness and purity of education. So what we see there in terms of the physical geography, I'm suggesting that we see ideologically. And many parents and teachers in schools, I think, can be helped by Lewis's philosophy of education. I believe that there is a distinct philosophy of education, not just in the abolition of man, but throughout his ethics, his theology, and his fiction that can be applied today to stop this erosion and undermining of the foundations that's going on. But we'll stick with Mia just a little bit longer. And uh, I don't know, uh, has anybody been to the English Lake District on holiday? Has anybody visited a place called Windermere? Okay, so it's the same word, Windermere. And a mere in England, or a mere in the Netherlands or Germany, my wife is from Germany uh, is an area of water, a lake, it's an inland sea, or at Zee, Zee. We have Windermere and the Isselmere in the Netherlands. There's a picture of Windermere, beautiful lake district, nice place for a holiday if you don't mind the rain. And the Isselmere on the other side of the North Sea in the Netherlands, a mere. And a mere provides a defense, but it also enables deserts to be irrigated. You may know that for Lewis, the aim of education was to irrigate deserts, to irrigate deserts. And we'll come back to that in just a moment. But of course, if a desert is irrigated, it goes from being sandy and salty and unproductive to yielding a bountiful harvest. And we're going to go back to my 1933 National Geographic magazine here. Here we see Rex in a grain field, which two years ago was a sea. Vessels sunk recently remain above the reclaimed bottom. Mere education is all about reclamation. Others lie buried under the sand, and a plough may easily be snagged on the hull of a ship. So here we have the corn growing in what used to be the sea bed. And for Lewis, the task of the modern educator is to irrigate deserts. And what he meant by that was that it's as teachers or parents uh, inculcate just sentiments that they enable the moral sense of their students to thrive, that they cultivate good character. They cultivate good character. And I think it's important that we don't, that we don't misunderstand this. The, the first 
chapter, the first part rather, of the abolition of man. Men without chests indicates that the chest, the character of students has not been given sufficient attention, that it's actually atrophied through lack of exercise. So if this was a cartoon character, uh, this would be uh, a character with a large head, sort of the opposite of the bodybuilder, the opposite of the muscle man, uh, with the you know with the strong chest and the tiny head. It would be a huge head and a tiny chest. The chest being the character, and the uh, notion here that C.S. Lewis puts forward is that the chest has been neglected. He doesn't say that we focused on the head too much. He says that we've focused on the character of young people too little. If I just bring that down to earth, I've just been doing lots of parent seminars with the parents of the children on our Nani and Virtues project. And normally I start by asking them if you had a choice uh, between 10 A star grades, uh, the highest grades that you can get when you're 16 um, in England, if you're given a choice of 10 A star grades for your child, or a young man, a young woman who is kind, honest, diligent, compassionate, just, fair, rather than deceitful, lazy, feckless, cruel. The parents in the room generally say uh, character first. It's the, the most important thing is the character of our child. I'd like to put it to you that it's not actually an either or, that if certain virtues have been developed and you know one is of good character, then that enables a personal best to be attained academically whether that will be the A stars or is it a GPA of, is, is four the highest here and high threes are, you know, the equivalent. Okay, so, you know, rather than a GPA of, you know, 3.9 or whatever it is, is that unattainable? Is that sort of very rare? No? Okay. Okay. Well, well, we'll come on to grading and assessment and excellence in education in just a moment and see what Lewis has to say about that. Um, but, you know, the, the parents, the salient point is, you know, the parents would go for character every time. And uh, Lewis says that schooling often fails to nurture the moral character of students. This is in The Abolition of Man. Uh, the chest which is the seat of emotions organized by trained habit into stable sentiments. Trained habit. Trained habit. And of course, this is a biblical injunction as well. Add to your faith virtue, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. And the basis, Lewis says, for this education of character, this education in virtue, is the Tao, natural law. He compares it to New York City uh, being there outside of us, objective value, uh, separate from us, not a mere product of the beholder's gaze. And, uh, you know, he says whether you, whether you, whatever you might think about New York, whether you love it or whether you hate it, uh, it is still there. It exists. And Lewis says that uh, the moment we see the Tao or moral law, natural law, as a mere subjective product 
rather than an objective reality, we cannot even talk about self-control or any other virtues that make us fully human. So he saw the danger of schooling working to persuade children that morality is subjective and just a matter of taste or opinion. He said that the student who thinks he or she is doing a straightforward English assignment or homework has no notion that ethics, theology and politics are all at stake. Okay, so just to become more practical before we open it up for questions and answers and comments and discussion. Because it seems to me that Lewis is remarkably practical. Remarkably practical. So I'm just going to take this from chapter four, uh, liberal education. And I just remind us that, that Lewis noted that every act of justice or charity involves putting ourselves in the other person's place. In reading great literature, I become a thousand men and yet remain myself. So Lewis's fiction, good literature, is invaluable for teaching children morality and virtue and for enabling them and enabling us to enter vicariously into the experience of others. So, the importance of parents. I'm going to do parents and dumbing down and assessment before we have some questions. So the importance of parents. I was told that uh, some students come to Wheaton College who have been home educated and that there were uh, a significant number of home educators in this area. And Lewis in Willing Slaves of the Welfare State is really critical of the state's involvement and I would go as far as to say the usurping of per the parental mandate to educate their children. He believes that a parent should be able to live his life, to live life in his own way, to call his house his castle to enjoy the fruits of his own labor and to educate his children as his conscience directs. So parents are clearly important in Lewis's thinking. And I'll say more about this this evening, but we're very keen to work with parents and to know more about how parents cultivate good character through response to the Narnia novels in their children and how teachers do that as well. So that's just to sort of whet your appetite for um, what Lewis says about the importance of parents. Uh, switching to the curriculum and how to avoid dumbing down. Some of this is um, controversial to 21st century years. He says, in drawing up its, the school's curriculum, it should always have chiefly in view the interests of the boy who wants to know and can know. The school should subordinate the interests of the many to those of the few. And he actually uses the word aristocratic um, Sometimes we talk about elitism, don't we? 
Uh, this is in his essay, Democratic Education, 1944. And he, he's really quite scathing uh, about vocational education being considered as a, an equivalent of academic education. Talks about Tommy and says, give him marks for his hobby, officialize it. Finally, fool the poor boy into the belief that what he is doing is just as clever in its own way as real work. I'm involved with a group of schools and there's something called the European Computer Driving Licence, which is equivalent to a GCSE, uh, an academic subject. And essentially, students can prove what they can already do, uh, you know, use a Word document and, um, you know, basic word processing and uh, so on. and gain a qualification for it. It seems that Lewis is prescient here. Give him marks for his hobby. Officialize it, certainly been officialized and incorporated into the examinations framework. And then grading. I referred to your grade point averages are, you know, a stars, A's, and so on, um, in Letters to Lewis, which Marjorie co-edited uh, in a letter to Joan in 1958. This is what a droll idea in Florida to give credits not for what you know, but for hours spent in the classroom. Rather like judging the condition of an animal, not by its weight or shape, but by the amount of food that had been offered it. This is the notion that, you know, the number of hours that you've spent doing something uh, is what matters rather than the quality. Uh, coincidentally, the first time I went to Florida, I had a conversation with someone and made the mistake of mentioning that I worked at a university. And the first thing they said to me was, how many years education do you have? How many years education? And I was quite bemused. I thought, years, years. What on earth has time got to do with anything? When we supervise PhD students, and you know they ask us how long it will take, um, sometimes rather unhelpfully, perhaps to the student. You know, the supervisor will say something like, well, when the thesis is ready, it's ready. Um, can't predict that that will be in three years' time or four years' time. And if it's not of a sufficient quality, then it can't go forwards to the viva. If it takes less time than that and it's of a, a sufficient quality, it can. So assessment. And as I say, some of this is, is controversial to, to 21st century ears in an all-must-have-prizes culture where nobody can fail and there is this huge emphasis on inclusion and everybody getting through. So Lewis is a bit of a, you know, provides something of a, an antidote to that. But I think it's also very important... Um, I think in closing, to, to say something briefly about, about humility. So Lewis does believe in excellence. We've seen that mere, mere education, mere Christianity, the word mere is where we get our word merit or excellence from, and that this is all about excellence, excellence in schooling, excellence in, in academic terms. Uh, but it's also very important to not be a snob, no, not to have any sort of snobbery or arrogance or pride here, while also having excellence, which is quite a challenge, I think, in an academic environment sometimes to pull off. But L Lewis is uh, very clear that you shouldn't be looking down your nose at other people and thinking that somebody else is inferior. And he also... Um, is very much aware 
of uh, his own character. In a letter to his friend Arthur Greaves, he said that he'd found out some dreadful things about his own character. Uh, the uh, Oxford tutorial system where, you know, a student comes in and um, gets one-to-one -one tuition uh, necessitated did the, the tutor preparing, you know, in advance and, uh, you know, having some pearls of wisdom to give. And Lewis says, I pretend I am carefully thinking out what to say to the next pupil for his good, of course. And then suddenly realise, I am really thinking how frightfully clever I am going to be and how he will admire me. And, and so the challenge, I think, for us, for teachers, for all those concerned with excellence and merit in, in education is to, um, to not compromise on the commitment to excellence, but also to not fall into the trap of pride, which is, you know, the worst of sins for Lewis, pride and, and arrogance, especially in spiritual terms, you know, thinking that you're better than somebody else. So that, that's really the challenge for us. And um, I think I'll leave it there and open it up for discussion. But uh, on the way to doing so, if you don't mind me being a little teacherly, uh, because I was a teacher for for 10 years, uh, we will have two or three minutes where perhaps you'd like to talk to somebody in the row next to you or in front of you or behind you uh, in terms of comment or questions that might have come out of this. So two or three minutes for a little uh, peer dialogue um, twos or threes, and then comments, questions, discussion for 10 or 15 minutes. Thank you so much. Okay, questions or comments, thoughts? Ladies and gentlemen, over to you. The ever controversial Lewis. Sure, I'll, I'll start us off. Thank you very much. This is, this is good. I've um, enjoyed it very much. One of the things that came to mind was um, uh, well, several things. So maybe I'll ask one and uh, some others to ask again. But uh, I'm a Christian, you know, right? We're in Wheaton College. Um, we don't necessarily struggle so much, I mean we do, but in different ways than kind of how it's being addressed in this research project of kind of moral development, character development here. It's, a, it's becoming a more of a national conversation here, but I'm, I'm imagining in Britain that there's sort of, there's pushback um, from the wider academy perhaps, or from or the public, and saying um, uh, how much religion is right linked to this, and about, hey, I can have good sort of character development, moral development, apart from religion, and wanting to kind of distance themselves from kind of a lot of the religion and English identity and what it means to be, you know, um, an English citizen. And it's like, I thank you very much. You know how to maximize pleasure and minimize pain, and I don't really need this sort of Narnian kind of moral development because it really leads to kind of these um, do's and don'ts, and it really doesn't make good sense. So I, I just, you know, I'm saying that kind of a devil's advocate counsel. But uh, wondering if, if there's any of that in the academy or in any of that in this research project. Yeah, so so we have had pushback, and some schools. Do, do you have Marmite here? Do you have Marmite? Oh, yes. Marmite? No, it's, it's strange. Yeah. What, what's it called here? Vegemite. Or, so, 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 okay. All right. So, so what we say about so so I love Marmite, and my my children hate it, 
and that's normally the kind of reaction that most people have to Marmite. So the Narnian Virtues is a bit of a Marmite project. It tends to polarise opinion, and you tend to have schools that are either not necessarily Christian schools, uh, but some schools that perhaps are more traditional or... You know, for, for whatever reason, they are very, very keen and committed to the uh, education in character, education in virtue and character development of their young people. And then you have the, uh, the opposite. The, you know, this is um, Christian indoctrination by the, by the back door. My own university ethics committee was, was uh, you know, terribly concerned that in state schools, public schools, children would actually, heaven forbid, learn about Christianity, you know, through through doing this project. So I, I wrote a very robust response and said, you know, the the primary aim of this project is not to focus on any supposed Christian allegory, you know, uh, Aslan giving his life for Edmund, uh, that's that's not the primary purpose. The primary purpose is to look at the six Narnian virtues of love and justice and integrity, um, so on, uh, and to see how characters in the novels demonstrate those virtues and then how those virtues can be applied to their own lives. So, for instance, Edmund with the Turkish delight showing no self-control. Uh, however, uh, it seems to me, and this was my response to the University Ethics Committee, that you know you cannot read Shakespeare's Measure for Measure in an English lesson well without knowing uh, where the title of the play is taken from. Uh, you cannot read Blake's A Poison Tree without knowing about the Garden of Eden, and uh, that, that therefore I'm terribly sorry, uh, but I cannot guarantee, you know, that no child will learn about, um, you know, the atonement or substitutionary sacrifice through, you know, through the Narnian Virtues project. Um, but yeah, a bit of a bit of a Marmite project. So received pretty, pretty fairly. It depends on the school. So, you know, some, some schools and some, some parents love it. Uh, not exclusively Christian parents by any means. Many, um, you know, community schools, state schools, you know, very keen see Lewis as a major author, a classic author, um, you know, best-selling writer of children's fiction, high-quality literature. And, uh, you know, certainly the... Um, the moral universe that he presents, where you know that the the consequences are the right consequences, if you like, for certain actions, is important because so much of other children's fiction, you don't get the right consequences from particular actions. So this moral universe that that Lewis depicts in Narnia. Um, leans in the, the the right moral direction and I think that that's that's incredibly important because a lot of the time when we talked about dumbing down but a lot of the time the evaluation of how moral a literary work is is simplified uh, you know does it have swearing in it does it have sex in it does you know and it's an incredibly simplistic take on the morality of a text without saying well actually in in which moral direction does this work incline and you know works like um, Swift's you know a modest proposal um, that's a satire that exposes human vice and folly. You know, you'd see violence in it, killing of babies in it, but it's a profoundly moral work that uses shock tactics and it leans in the right direction. So um, I think there are schools, educators, parents that like it for that reason. Thank you. But I've not, I've dodged the question. I've not answered, you know, where you get your morality from if it isn't from religion or if it isn't from Christianity. 
In fact, I went to a conference in Washington, D.C., uh, and I had done a, a, a case study of a school with a Christian ethos that was the most improved academy in Britain. Uh, so the government was so desperate that it actually gave the school to a Christian organization to run. And the, the Christian organization had transformed the school in terms of its academic results. And um, the, um, you know, it, it, was, it was this, you know, the most improved academy in England um, which, which you know, which which was just astonishing. But um, the conference, I, I, I'd, it's the only time I've ever had my abstract changed. You know, the paragraph you put in describing what, you, and I had said that this is a Christian foundation or Christian ethos school. I explained that it was UK and the state sector and so on, and it actually we changed to faith based. From, from Christian. So the first thing I did at the conference was to stand up and say, I just need to be intellectually honest here and say that the moral education of this school was not based on the teaching of the Buddha or Muhammad, but the life, work, teaching and ministry of Jesus Christ. Just to be intellectually honest and accurate about this. So, yeah. Hello. Uh, what did they ask the organization and, and what school it was? And as a follow up, I'm wondering if, um, what, what it's like in the UK. Um, here in the States, we have a movement, a classical Christian movement. Yeah. Um, that's uh, quite fruitful. Um, I'm wondering if you see that in the UK uh, at all. In the private sector, what we, we would consider the private sector? Yeah, I suppose this is more like free schools. Um, it's the Emmanuel Schools Foundation that has schools uh, in the northeast. So from Newcastle, which is 100 miles north of Leeds, and Blythe, which is about 30 miles north of Newcastle, down, down to Doncaster, and over to Middlesbrough, petrochemicals, the, the kinds of places that would be described. Well, it's not really Rust Belt, it's more sort of former collieries and mines and, uh, you know, heavy industry, shipbuilding, shipbuilding, mining. Um, is, that, is that what the Rust Belt means? Or is it... It's former steel. Yeah, this isn't, this isn't really steel. This is mining and, and shipbuilding. Um, yeah, so, so it, and, and it was Trinity Academy. Uh, which which was in Doncaster, and I and I published the case study in the Oxford Re Review of Education, which is a you know a good place, and uh, the next issue was uh, you know shot down by uh, three academics, the head of education at Goldsmiths London, who said, you know Pike doesn't know what he's talking about. This is too good to be true. Uh, the the catchment area, the population of students must have changed. They must have built a middle-class housing estate, or they must have started busing children from a different area, because this is this really is too good to be true. And then I had the right of reply in you know the next issue of the Oxford Review of Education, uh, which was really easy uh, because it's a one-school town, and there had been no new building developments. Uh, and you, you know, you leave Doncaster and you go through sort of 10 miles of nothingness until you get to the small former colliery town where this school is. And so I was able to say, no, no children are bussed in and there's been no middle class housing estate. It is just that the, you know, the school is under new and very different management. Yeah. But that's more like your your free schools. So these schools are, I mean, are they private or public? I mean, they they are publicly funded, but they are not state schools in the sense that they have considerable autonomy and can really um, autonomy over the curriculum, you know, the governors, the appointments of staff, and so on. So sort of middle ground. Yeah. 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 
but you have more people going to what I think of as affordable private schools, don't you hear? Rather than very, very expensive public schools in the UK like Eton and Marlborough. Um, have I got that right? Yes. Okay. Because you get taxed so much less, of course. Yeah, so I found it really challenging. Um, I was a curriculum manager in a school, and I found it challenging as a Christian. So, for instance, uh, as a curriculum manager in a school, I was responsible for uh, the children in set one, the highest academic groups, having one teacher to 36 children and the children in the lowest academic group having six or eight children in the class with a teacher plus a teacher's assistant. So the school was disproportionately favoring the less able in terms of its allocation of resources. This is awfully challenging as a Christian as well but you could say that the most able children who were put in a class, a very large class of 36 with only one teacher, were having far less money spent on them than the children who were not going to attain academic qualifications. So some of Lewis's um, essay, Democratic Education, you know, really challenged challenge that but I think that part of the problem is that we so unlike unlike places like Germany we seem to in the UK try to put everybody through an academic curriculum so I think that's partly where the you know where the problem comes from rather than having you know gymnasium and then um, really good vocational technical Hochschulers um, and apprenticeships. In, you know, in in Germany, you know, we we seem to insist on this academic curriculum for, you know, for everybody. But Lewis's thinking is really challenging there because, you know, he says base your curriculum on the ones who can know and who want to know. You know, employ the Latin teacher, even though the masses may not study it really really challenging in terms of a lot of our you know our educational thinking uh, challenging in terms of um, you know all must have prizes you know challenging in terms of setting so I know schools that will not put children into sets um, you know Lewis talks about um, having children you know who could be reading Aeschylus in the same class as you know, those who are spelling out the cat sat on the mat. Not that it is not important for children to learn how to spell out the cat sat on the mat, but he says, you know, you, there's this unwillingness to differentiate or to say that one is better than the other. It's, oh, goodness knows. You know, you can't say one is better than the other for fear of giving the less academic child a trauma. This is Lewis. And I, I think that, you know, I need a plumber and I can't do the work that a plumber does. And plumbers often earn more than teachers. But to suggest that plumbing, you know, is equivalent to something academic does, doesn't make sense. So he, he's quite, um, you know, he's quite realistic and refreshing, really, in, in, in terms of challenging some of this uh, rhetoric of inclusion where you can't, you know, you can't differentiate and say, oh, this is better than this. 
He says, no, 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 you can. And this is all about merit and excellence in, in schooling and in education. So, you know, we have schools that, you know, won't um, advertise or publicize their successes in terms of university destinations for their students for fear of making students who go to uh, institutions that are lower down the rankings feel bad. So he, he problematizes some of this political correctness in quite a refreshing way. But well, I think pride is a huge problem also, which is why I ended, you know, pride is a huge problem in education and among educators, and he tackles that too, which, uh, which I think is healthy and, and important. One last question, or do we end there? Yep. for Christian groups to take over yeah. the wing mm -hmm. and saw dramatic improvements and recidivism rates yes. and such. Yeah. I, th I think that that's... Um, I find that a persuasive model, but I think that the Christian organizations that take on failing schools in former mining towns or tough prisons have a weighty responsibility because when they get it right uh, that's great and they're serving society and they're serving some of the most needy in society but if they get it wrong the media is merciless and you know having Christian organizations doing a bad job whether it's running prisons or running schools um, presents all kinds of problems, you know, not least for the people in them who then start to identify Christian with, you know, bad management practices or, you know, whatever. So I think if you are going to be a Christian organization running schools or running prisons or whatever it is, you have this moral obligation to deliver excellence and and not to, you know, not to make excuses. Yeah. Thank you, Mark, and thank you all for coming. I hope you'll come back tonight at 7 o'clock for the Learning and Virtues Project.